May God open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to love. Last Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, and today is the first Sunday in the season of Lent that leads us to Good Friday and Easter Sunday. On Wednesday evening, a dozen or so Pitt Street people gathered here, close to the communion table, and marked the beginning of this reflective season by reminding ourselves of our connection to the sacred, to each other, and to the earth. On either our forehead or the back of one hand, we received a mark of ash, mixed with a little water to remember our baptism, and a little oil to symbolize healing. The brief liturgy reminded us of our connection to matter, to the molecules of our body and all of creation, and to the spark of our spirits. The opening prayer included these words. May God guide us as we perform simple acts of love and prayer and real works of reform and renewal. Let us love deeply the earth which gives us air to breathe, water to drink and food to sustain us. May we remember that life is begotten from stardust, radiant in light and heat. We are all one, all of creation, all that now lives, all that have ever lived. Remember we are stardust, and to stardust we will return. Remember we are connected, and to connection we return. Remember, we are part of the great mystery. Remember, we are stardust, and to stardust we return. And when the ashes were shared, the words, you are stardust, were said to each person. Stardust of apparently grey carbon. Stardust containing the spark of light and life. Those of us who gathered recalled that though we were small in number, we were part of a wider community, many of whom do not live or work near the city, a gathered community that included all of you. And we honoured the stardust origin and destiny of everyone. A week before last Wednesday, the worship team had talked a little bit about Lent. Some of the people who had been here a long while talked about creating the banner that we have up today. It has images of desert and oasis. When it was created, the intent was to contrast the barren desert with the beauty of paradise, perhaps a paradise that evoked the Garden of Eden. But as the banner was designed and worked on, the contrast became less obvious. In the completed banner, both the desert and the garden are beautiful and the path is no longer linear. And then our conversation moved on to Australian spirituality. And Sue Gehrig made the observation that we have a tendency to romanticize the bush in Australia. Literature and poetry have fostered a bush identity of the Australian soul, rugged, rough, independent, and slightly wild. And yet the vast majority of us live on the coast we see the beauty of the outback and the bush, the red centre, but it seems that most of us wouldn't actually want to live there. Last Sunday morning, Robin Floyd spoke about the installation of large candles and ribbon that we had for our transfiguration service. And she went on to talk about the conversation from the worship team about desert, heartland and coast. And after Robin's talking, Beth Sargent reminded me of the second verse of Australian hymn writer Robin Mann's song, For You Deep Stillness. I knew the song from other places that I have been in the Uniting Church, but had forgotten the words. From the edges, seek the heartlands. From the edges, seek the heartlands. And when you're burned by the journey, May the cool winds of the hovering spirit soothe and replenish you in the name of Christ, in the name of Christ. 
Robin Mann invites us in that song to the desert heartland. The vision placed before us is not romantic. The sun and the desert winds will burn. But he also offers us reassurance as we journey that we are to be accompanied by a refreshing spirit, the spirit released into the world through the love and life, the suffering and death of Jesus. Lent is a time for memory and for return. It is also a path, a way, a way that we make in our own lives as we follow the path, the way of Jesus. At the beginning of Lent, we hear this call, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Mark's gospel calls us relentlessly to join this path, this path into the desert and back again, to the wilderness where the wild things are, in order that we may lead wild and precious lives with purpose, connected to the accompanying spirit, recognizing that we humans are the carbon of stardust, stardust that contains within its atomic structure the spark of divine life. Mark's gospel is in such a rush that it doesn't spell out the details about Jesus' time in the wilderness. Sometimes the key to the theological meaning of a gospel passage is found inside its structure. Structurally, this story narrates just like a textbook rite of passage. The candidate is singled out and taken for a proverbial length of time to a liminal space, a thin place where old identities dissolve and new ones are forged before he or she is thrust back into society with a new identity to enact a new role. Unlike Matthew and Luke, Mark's gospel doesn't go into the detail of the temptations. We are told only that Jesus was tempted by Satan, that he was with the wild beasts, and that the angels waited on him. New Testament theologians suggest that Mark is using this stark story to preview the rest of his gospel. Jesus spends time in the company of wild beasts. The desert is the place where the wild things are. The rest of Mark's gospel portrays Jesus as a wild thing, as one who refuses to be domesticated into the household of conventional religion. Jesus' disruptive, taboo-violating ministry of touching lepers and bleeding women, of healing on the Sabbath, of eating with tax collectors and sinners, turns this, his earthly career into liminal space, into liminal time for all the other gospel characters that are recounted by Mark. As we listen to the stories of Jesus in the coming weeks, we will hear of this disturbing wildness which unsettles and threatens the scribes and the Pharisees who refuse to deepen their religious journeys, preferring to remain in some kind of religious childhood rather than take the path of initiation through to maturity. Even the 12 disciples resist the transition by refusing to let go of their old identities. Identifying with the stories in Lent connects us to our own path, our own journeying of the way of the Lord. Yes, preparing the way of the Lord is preparing the way of Jesus. It is about making a space for him in our lives. But it's not a path that we prepare in order to walk, watch him walk by us like some kind of celebrity or superstar. It is a path that we are called to make in order that we can walk alongside Jesus and alongside his sometimes stumbling friends who we might identify with. This preparation in this time forces us into a rite of passage to struggle through the tensions of holding on and letting go. This is exactly where we belong on the first Sunday in Lent. This week, my own Lenten reflections 
return me to the wisdom of Howard Thurman. Before I went to live in New York in the early 80s, I knew nothing of Thurman, who had died just a couple of years earlier. Born in 1899, he was an African-American theologian, a Baptist minister, an author, philosopher, educator, and civil rights leader. As a prominent religious leader, he played a leading role in many social justice movements and organizations of the 20th century. Thurman's theology of radical nonviolence influenced and shaped a generation of civil rights activists, and he was a key mentor to leaders in the movement like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The Thurman quote, and he has many quotable quotes, that resonates with me this Lent is from near the end of his amazing life in a speech to Spelman College students in 1980, a speech that is sometimes called the sound of the genuine. Thurman told the students in a predominantly African-American college, there is something in every one of you that waits, listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. And if you cannot hear it, you will never find whatever it is that you are searching for. And if you hear it and then do not follow it, it was better that you had never been born. You are the only you, he said. You are the only you that has ever lived. Your idiom is the only idiom of its kind in all of existence. And if you cannot hear the sound of the genuine in you, you will spend your life, spend your days, on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. You will spend your life, spend your days, on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. I rediscovered Howard Thurman this week via Parker Palmer. Through Lent, Palmer suggests that we ask ourselves, am I speaking and acting from the sound of the genuine in me? Or am I tied to the ends of strings that other people pull? In our anxious world, there are puppeteers in the government and in parts of the mass media that are pulling our strings day and night. The government's rhetoric about refugees and asylum seekers, about African immigrants, is both evil and masterful. The demonizing sound bites tie us to strings that pull us away from being truly human, pull us away from being who we were created to be, who we genuinely are. Some of those strings pull people towards fearing or hating whole groups of people as defined by their race, nationality, religion, or sexual orientation. Some of them pull people towards living in the moment of consumption and short-term gratification, rather than in relation to the earth. Some strings pull us towards blaming the victim in crimes ranging from sexual assault to the deaths of indigenous people in incarceration. Others pull us away from the poor and from people who are homeless. The call to reflection in Lent does not require us to turn away from the world. In the desert, we spend time with the wild things so that we too may be wild, that we too may be undomesticated by conventional religion and the politics of division. In Lent, we pay attention to what's pulling our strings. In Lent, we listen for the sound of the genuine. And hopefully, in Lent, we cut the strings of all that pulls us away from being human in community with one another, with the earth, and with our rainbow God. Amen.